Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we are going to be talking about using the Mellon transform for integration. So we're going to go over everything about the Mellon transform that you need to know in order to solve some pretty straightforward integrals. Now please note that the Mellon transform can be used on a much higher level to do all sorts of different things but we're only going to be talking about the lower level stuff because I don't really feel qualified to speak on other stuff like that but it's going to be a nice intro introduction to the Mellon transform and how to use it. So in this video we're going to go over the definition the inverse transform, Ramanujan's master theorem, though I already have another video on that, which I will put as a card when we get to that, application to integration, some tricks with limits, and we're also going to talk about Mellon convolution. So let's go ahead and jump, jump right into it. So what is the Mellon transform? Well, it's very similar to the Laplace transform, obviously. They're both integral transforms. So the Mellon transform of a function f of x can be written as a function of s, and it's the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times f of x dx. So again, it's very similar to the Laplace and Fourier transforms, but it deals with powers of x rather than exponentials, which makes it useful for certain types of integration problems, which you'll see later. And in addition to that, the Ramanujan's master theorem makes taking Mellon transforms of functions which have power series very, very, very easy, which is always incredibly useful. So let's go ahead and take a look at... Um, yeah, how that's going to work out for us. So, oh yeah, also here is the Mellon inversion theorem. Now, this isn't really important to know for integration. I just think it's interesting to know, so you can go ahead and skip this section if you want. But there's actually a formula for the inverse Mellon transform, which is f of x equals 1 over 2 pi i, the integral from gamma minus i infinity to gamma plus i infinity. Now, gamma is just an arbitrary constant, which has to be within the region of convergence of the Mellon transform. So, for example, if the Mellon transform converges between s equals 0 and s equals 1, then gamma has to be between 0 and 1. And it's just a straight line integral, as you see I've written out in the complex plane right here. And then we're multiplying f of s times x to the negative s times ds. And it's relatively easy to prove this using the Fourier inversion theorem. Uh, this value of gamma must be within the strip of convergence. And it's not particularly useful for our cases, but in higher level integrals, this is really going to be the way that you're going to be taking the inverse Mellon transform in any situation. And you'll see here, I have this red dotted line, and that just represents the way that we usually close the contour when we're calculating an inverse Mellon transform. We just close the contour in the left half plane, and this x to the negative s will go to zero if x is large. So Ramanujan's Bastard Theorem, this is the easiest way to calculate a wide variety of Mellon transforms. Now some of them we can't actually evaluate just from the definition, but some of them it's just going to be better to use this theorem because it's so much more powerful and so much more widely applicable. So if we have some function that's equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative x to the n over n factorial times some other function phi of n, so basically you know, if phi of n is 1, then we get e to the negative x. If phi of n is something else, then we're going to get different functions. And basically, this tells us that our function f of s, our Mellon transform, is going to be gamma of s times phi of negative s, which kind of sounds like a little bit of magic, because this was a discrete function, and this is now a continuous function. But obviously, we have some uh, requirements on phi of s. We need it to have no poles in the left half plane and not experience factorial-like growth in the left half plane either. And of course, obviously, you don't want to choose values of phi of s that are going to um, give you imaginary numbers when s is real and the function is real, because that doesn't really make any sense at all. So I have another video on this that can show you how to apply this theorem to several different Mellon transforms. And again, other Mellon transforms can just be evaluated from the definition. So I'll go ahead and link that video right here. Go ahead and watch it if you want to learn how to use Ramanujan's Master Theorem. So here's basically just a table of important Mellon transforms, and I'm now just realizing that I have the first one in the list, which is the most important, completely wrong. Um, so let me fix that real quick. This is e to the negative x. So the Mellon transform e to the negative x is just gamma of s. For sine of x, we have gamma of s times sine pi over 2s. For cosine of x, same thing, but with cosine. For 1 over 1 plus x, we have pi cosecant pi s. And for 1 over 1 minus x, we have pi cot pi x. And something I want to note here is this 1 over 1 minus x. Obviously, we're going to have a singularity at x equals 1. And so essentially, this Mellon transform is really representing the principal value of that integral from 0 to infinity, which will give you this value right here. Then 1 over e to the x minus 1 is gamma of s times zeta of s. 1 over e to the x plus 1 is gamma of s times eta of s. 
hyperbolic secant of x is going to give you 2 times gamma of s times beta of s, where this is the beta function, it's just a series definition. And for hyperbolic cosecant of x, we just get 2 times gamma of s times theta of s times 1 minus 2 to the negative s. So let's talk about using Mellon transforms to evaluate integrals, because after all, that's what the video is about. So the main time that I end up using Mellon transforms to evaluate integrals is I see integrals of the form x to the a times f of x minus x to the a times g of x dx integrated from 0 to infinity. And the interesting thing about this is that in general when we split these two up we have this f of x minus g of x. If we split it, split it up into two integrals these are going to diverge. Now if they don't diverge then you can just evaluate these two by themselves and then you're done with the problem, right? So the, the reason that the Mellon transform comes in is if these diverge by themselves, that means we have to evaluate it as a whole. So what we do instead is we set a, a function i of s equal to our basic layer integral, except we replace a with s minus 1. And so this tells us, okay, well we know that the value of this integral is going to be f of s minus g of s. And notice that I said for some s um, between alpha and beta. And what I mean by this is Notice that we said x to the a times f of x integrated from 0 to infinity diverges, and same thing with g of x. So that means that this formula for i of s is only valid for uh, for certain values of s, and that value of s does not include s equals a plus 1 because we already know that this diverges. However, the interesting thing here is that if we have these two functions connected and we know their Mellon transforms, if we know that this original integral converges, then we can make the argument that i of s will continue to be equal to f of s minus g of s even when these individual integrals don't converge. And that's called analytic continuation. So this sounds a little bit weird, so we're going to go over uh, an example. But essentially, even if a plus 1 is outside of alpha beta, which is of course our region of convergence which applies to both of these, um, because the original integral does not converge when split, we can analytically continue i of s to s equals a plus 1, or in some cases we're going to need to take the limit as s goes to a plus 1. And so then we just take the limit as s goes to a plus 1 of i of s, and that gives us our original integral i. So let's go over an example right here. We have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x over x to the 3 halves minus 1 over x plus 1 x to the 3 halves. Now one thing I do want to note here is that um, you know, if you go ahead and plug in either of these integrals by themselves, you'll find it just diverges because of the singularity at 0. So what we do instead is we parameterize and we, we set an integral i of s equals the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times e to the negative x minus x to the s minus 1 over x plus 1 dx. And these are really easy to evaluate because we already know the Mellon transform of both these functions. So for example, x to the s minus 1 e to the negative x dx equals gamma of s. Notice that this only applies for s greater than 0 because if s is less than 0, this whole integral diverges. And for this other one, x to the s minus 1 over x plus 1 integrated from 0 to infinity is pi cosecant pi s. And again, this applies when 0 is between, uh, when s is between 0 and 1, which means that the common domain between these two Mellon transforms is uh, s goes between 0 and 1. So this means that our function i of s is going to be gamma of s minus pi cosecant pi of s wherever, whenever s is between 0 and 1. But what we can do is we argue whenever i of s converges, the integral of i of s converges, it will still adhere to this same formula, even if these two individual integrals didn't converge by themselves. So i of s will still converge to this formula for numbers outside the region of convergence for each section of the integral, as long as i of s itself still converges. So we do have to check that i of s converges at 3 halves, and it's relatively easy to do that using some power series arguments. And this is essentially what's called analytic continuation. Although this formula, in theory, should only apply for s between 0 and 1, we assume that i of s will take on the same formula everywhere in the complex plane. And this is just... I, it seems a little bit like magic, but that's really the essence of what analytic continuation is. And if you go ahead and plug in the numbers, you'll find that it really does work out. So all we have to do now is plug in i of negative 1 half, and that's super easy. Gamma of negative 1 half is negative 2 root pi, and um, then this we get cosecant negative pi over 2, and so we just get pi minus 2 root pi. And if you go ahead and plug in the numbers, you'll find that this matches up exactly because i of s really does converge to this formula everywhere in the complex plane where the integral converges. So let's look at a, another example right here. So 
something that we'll often get because of the nature of the Mellon transform is we'll get a lot of limits which involve the gamma and zeta functions. So for example, right here we have the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over e to the x minus 1 minus e to the negative x over x dx. So we set this i of s equals integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 over e to the x minus 1 minus x to the s minus 2 e to the negative x. This is another thing to keep, keep note of. Notice I have this x minus, uh, s minus 2 here because again, notice here we have no power of, of x, so we have x to the 0 and here we have x to the negative 1. So we have to make sure when we're defining our i of s that we can set some value of s and get back the original integral. So in that case, that means the exponent of x in the second term has to be 1 less than the exponent of s over here, which matches up. So what we end up doing here is uh, this one uh, becomes gamma of s, zeta of s, and this one becomes gamma of s minus 1. Now what we go ahead and do is we're taking the limit as s goes to 1, because again when we set s equals 1, we get back our original integral. So this is limit as s goes to 1 of gamma of s, zeta of s, minus gamma s minus 1. And we go ahead and factor out gamma of s everywhere, and since gamma of s minus 1 is the same as gamma of s over s minus 1, we can just go ahead and factor that out. And then we get the limit as s goes to 1 of gamma of s, which is just 1, times the limit as s goes to 1 of zeta of s minus 1 over s minus 1, which is just gamma. So overall, our, our answer is gamma. And I'll go over where this comes from in a moment. So tricks involving limits with gamma, zeta, and eta functions. So um, these functions are not ones that we usually are used to doing a lot of limits with, but whenever you're doing the Mellon transform, you're going to end up doing a lot of limits with these weird functions. So get used to having to use sort of these odd tricks that I'm going to talk about. So first of all is just obviously the recurrence relation for the gamma function. So for example, if we're taking limit as s goes to 0 of gamma of s minus 1 over s, we can go every time we see gamma of s and s going to 0, what we can do is we can rewrite this as s gamma of s over s. And s gamma of s is just gamma of s plus 1. And again, s is going to 0, so gamma of s plus 1 is just going to end up being 1. And then it's all over s. So Notice in this situation, we have limited s goes to 0, gamma s plus 1 minus 1 over s. Again, we just multiplied on the top and bottom by s. And this made everything a little bit easier because now we just use the hospital's rule, and we get gamma prime of 1 for our answer, and that's just negative gamma. Next is the uh, actual, actually the Lorentz series around s equals 1 for the zeta function, which I think is pretty interesting. So the Lorentz series here is 1 over s minus 1 plus gamma plus other terms of order s minus 1 and above. And the reason we're omitting the rest of these terms is usually they won't be that important. So let me show you an example. Here, we're taking the limit as s goes to 1 of zeta of s minus 1 over s minus 1. It's the same as the limit as s goes to 1 of 1 over s minus 1 plus gamma plus some other terms of order s minus 1, uh, of order s minus 1 and above, and then minus 1 over s minus 1. So of course, these are just going to cancel with each other. It's just the residue of the zeta function canceling out. And all these terms of order s minus 1 and above, of course, they're just going to be uh, 0. Because, I mean, if you think about it, the, the series is going to be s minus 1 plus some constant times s minus 1 squared. And when we plug in s equals 1, all of those are going to disappear. So we're just left with gamma. And that's the answer to that limit right there. Another important one is gamma prime of s over gamma of s equals digamma of s. So usually it's easier to just deal with the digamma function since it has some nice, uh, easy to define values. So whenever we see gamma prime of s and gamma of s in a similar limit, we're just going to turn it all into digamma of s. So for example, limit as s goes to 0, s squared gamma of s minus gamma prime of s. It's the same thing as the limit as s goes to 0. Now I factored out everywhere s gamma of s. So what we end up with is uh, what, what's left over is 1 minus di gamma of s on the top and then 1 over s on the bottom because we have that leftover s from this s squared, right? So this limit as s goes to 0 of s gamma of s is just limit as s goes to 0 of gamma s plus 1, which is just 1. And then for this part right here, I just use the recurrence relation for the di gamma function. We get 1 plus 1 over s minus, minus di gamma of s plus 1 all over 1 over s. And notice that di gamma s plus 1 is just going to be some constant. It's minus gamma, and this is just going to be 1. And since we're going to 0, it's really this s term, 1 over s term, that's going to dominate. So we only need to look at the coefficients of these since they both go to infinity. And so overall, we're just going to get 1. And another thing to keep in mind, I don't have an example for this because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the eta function, eta of s, can be rewritten as 1 minus 2 to the 1 minus s, uh, zeta of s. 
So if you're ever dealing with the zeta function and the eta function at the same time, and they're subtracting each other, you want to probably use this formula to make it a little bit simpler. So here's another uh, thing to keep in mind. So I actually don't really have any examples for this because I have not come across any problems where it's really easy to show how using parameterization is going to help um, solve the problem. But in theory, we can also parameterize an integral and then take the Mellon transform with respect to the new variable, evaluate the integral, and invert the Mellon transform. So basically the same thing we do with Feynman's trick. We introduce a parameter, we differentiate with respect to that parameter, we evaluate the integral, and then we integrate back. Except in this case, instead of differentiating, we're going to take the Mellon transform, and then we're going to take the inverse Mellon transform. However, again, I haven't really found a problem that's really like a good example for how to use this method. But essentially, that would be the process. Now, a good thing to keep in mind that I, I do use a lot, actually, is that the partial derivative with respect to s of x to the s minus 1 is just x to the s minus 1 times ln x. So that means if we have the Mellon transform of some function, when we differentiate with respect to s, which is going to be really easy because all we need to do is differentiate that function for the Mellon transform, we get the uh, integral from 0 to infinity of x to the s minus 1 times ln x times f of x dx. So basically, whenever you see an ln x mixed in with your Mellon transforms, just remember, all you have to do is differentiate the Mellon transform, and you end up getting that ln x popping out. And another really cool theorem that I, again, have yet to use, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're ever working on a problem. If you have a function defined by an integral, we're going to call it i of x equals the integral from 0 to infinity of f of x, y times g of y, dy. It's actually really interesting. If you take the Mellon transform of this function i of x, it's the same as the Mellon transform of the function f of x times the Mellon transform of the function g of s, except a g, of, g of y, I guess g of x doesn't matter. Um, except instead of having s, you're going to replace everything with 1 minus s, which I think is kind of cool. Um, let's see, what else? Oh yeah, that's it. Now all we have is some practice problems. Now note, not all of these are going to be uh, exactly like the same thing as the examples in the video, but they all should be, you guys should be able to figure it out just based on the content in the video. Um, so yeah, so go ahead and try these practice problems. Again, if you need any help or you have any questions about these problems, I'm happy to answer them. You can go ahead and join the Discord, which will be in the description. So yeah. All right, so hopefully you were able to figure out all those problems. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. Hopefully you learned a lot and you're able to tackle some tough-looking problems using the Mellon Transform. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I will see you next time. Thanks, and bye.